In this video, we're going to use a FET simulation to understand the Bohr model. Now, I'm first going to uh, shine some white light at a box containing hydrogen. White light contains photons of all different wavelengths, so we just really have a great mixture of light going into this box of hydrogen. And as we wait, what we can see is that um, there are photons that are being absorbed, actually. It's tough to tell which ones aren't kind of coming out the other side. Um, but we also can see, using a spectrometer, that there are photons being emitted by the hydrogen in the box. And as we look at these uh, emissions, we can see um, that there are some certain <clears throat> wavelengths of light that are being uh, emitted. We're seeing a whole lot of um, photons being emitted that are in the ultraviolet range, uh, around 100 nanometers. Um, we're seeing a few um, in the visible spectrum, and as of now, all of them apparently are at around 650 nanometers. Um, if we were to leave this long enough, we'd see a few other ticks. Um, we're also getting um, some in the infrared range, which is greater than 780 nanometers. Uh, thus far, we've only seen one. If we let it go, we'd eventually see a few more. Um, but what's kind of interesting about this is you might be wondering, why is it that hydrogen is only emitting certain specific wavelengths of energy? We're not getting the full spectrum here. We're only getting a few specific wavelengths. And there are a couple more, but we're certainly not getting like 500, 501, 502, 503, etc. And this is a problem with Rutherford's solar system model of the atom. In, uh, in Rutherford's time, he was able to discover there is a nucleus, but he didn't really understand why it is that uh, the electron didn't simply spiral into the nucleus. Um, which actually, let's let's take a look at his model um, and go to, here it is, the classical solar system model. So I'm going to play this. Note there's a negative electron and a positive nucleus, and they are attracted to each other. There's a potential energy um, between them because they have the potential to come together. But this is what should happen. Whoops, that was fast. Maybe I'll do this again. And notice how it's sort of slowly spiraling, spiraling, and notice how the um, electron's energy is also dropping until eventually the electron spirals into the nucleus and, you know, existence is no more. Um, so apparently there was something wrong with Rutherford's model, right? Um, he also thought that, you know, why isn't it that an electron could just have any specific value of energy? And we saw it having all sorts of different energy values as it was spiraling towards the nucleus. Um, why can't it have any, any energy level? Like, look, I'm, I'm, you can see it lowering until eventually it drops into oblivion. Um, the emission spectrum that we saw in the previous case suggests otherwise. It suggests maybe the electron can only have certain specific energy levels, which is why it is that there are only specific certain wavelengths that are emitted by hydrogen. So Bohr came up with his model of the atom. And his model was that, you know, the electron can exist in certain shells and certain um, energy levels. And um, according to his model, um, an electron, if struck by a photon with a certain specific energy value, it can raise to a higher energy level. So for example, if I were to change this to monochromatic light, where it only has a wavelength of 94 nanometers, and I were to turn on the light, let's see what happens. I'll make it a little faster. There we go. And okay, look, I'm gonna turn off the light now just so it's not clouding our, our vision here. But one of those photons hit the electron when the electron was in the N equals one shell. And that caused the electron to raise up to the N equals six shell. So you can see it there and okay, it dropped back down. You see, 
the electron is going to be unstable in this higher energy level. There's room for it to drop back down. And what we just saw is that it did. Um, in dropping down, um, it could have gone all the way back down straight to the n equals one. Um, and if it did that, it would have released a photon of 94 nanometers, um, just the same way as that same wavelength caused it to go from one to six, going from six to one would result in an emission uh, at that same um, wavelength. But in this case, it released a photon um, with a wavelength, well, somewhere over here, um, it was definitely in the infrared, and you can actually see it right here. It's this one that looks kind of red-ish. Um, so, of course, it's still unstable, and look, it just went from the third down to the first shell, and it released another photon, which we can see floating away here, and it is in the ultraviolet range with a wavelength somewhere in the 90s of nanometers. Um, that's all well and good. Um, every time the electron drops in energy, it emits a photon, and the sum of the energy of those two um, photons that were emitted, this should say photons, not electrons, but the sum of the two energies of um, the photons released when the electron dropped from the sixth down to the third, I believe it was, and then from the third down to the first, that sum is equal to um, the energy of the elect of the photon with 94 nanometers that got the electron up to the sixth shell in the first place. Um, so let's play around here. Let's use um, light with a wavelength of 95 nanometers and see what happens. Okay. This time it jumped up to the fifth shell. So uh, longer wavelength means less energy. So the photon couldn't, or sorry, the electron couldn't go all the way up to the sixth shell. This time it only went up to the fifth. But there it is, and oh, it just dropped from the fifth down to the first, and it released another photon. Okay, great. Let's change it to 97 nanometers, a longer wavelength still, and a, sh a lower energy. And here we go. Okay, so this time it went up to the fourth shell, you can see there. So, um, and it went from the fourth straight down to the first. Okay, so um, 94 nanometers brings us up to the sixth shell. 95 nanometers only brings us up to the fifth shell. 97 brings us up to the fourth shell. What if we were to use 96 nanometers? Would we get to the four and a half? or something like that, what would happen? Nothing. Nothing. The photons just pass right by. It's not like the electron absorbs some of the energy from the photon. No, it absorbs nothing. The light just passes straight through. And there's a good reasoning for this. You see, the photon with a 95 nanometer wavelength that had energy exactly equal to the potential uh, energy difference between the electron being in the fifth shell versus the first shell. When you take the difference in those potential energies, they're exactly the same as the energy of the photon with 95 nanometer wavelength. Um, and similarly, the difference between the potential energy of the electron in the fourth shell versus the first shell, that is equal to the kinetic energy of the photon with 97 nanometers as a wavelength, but in the case of the 96 nanometers, kind of like neither here nor there, um, the that photon has energy that's not equal to the difference between the first shell and any shell. Um, and so the light just passes straight through. All right, so enough with this simulation. Let's talk about Bohr's data. Um, Bohr didn't actually shine light on his hydrogen sample. What he did was he used a gas discharge tube, um, basically pumped electrical current through, and that is a little bit more random. Um, but in a sample of a lot of hydrogen atoms, that caused electrons to jump up to the fifth shell, and the seventh shell, and the eighth shell, and the fourth shell, and et cetera, et cetera. And at any given time, there would be a whole bunch of atoms with electrons in the n equals 2 state, or the n equals 3 or 4. Um, 
he saw that the hydrogen released light, he saw that because this was in the visible spectrum, um, at least some of it was, and um, it looked kind of purple, but that was really a blend of multiple wavelengths. Uh, and he knew this because he took that light and shined it through a prism, and that prism caused the separation of different wavelengths of light. And so, um, for example, there was a red light with a wavelength of 656 nanometers. And we saw that earlier uh, in the simulation. You may recall um, that that was uh, when the electron dropped from the third down to the second shell. Well, um, when the electron went from the fourth down to the second shell, uh, the photon released had a wavelength of 486 nanometers, a shorter wavelength corresponding to a larger energy difference, um, and so on and so forth. The um, photon released when the electron goes from the fifth to the second, well, that's our blue, uh, our blue violet with a wavelength of 434 nanometers. And this violet at 410 nanometers corresponds to a drop from the sixth shell down to the second shell. Um, Bohr, he observed these very discrete uh, emission wavelengths, not a continuous spectrum. And he was able to sort of use that to conclude that there can only be these certain energy levels. And it was later revealed that um, any transition ending with the electron, yeah, with the electron in the second shell, that was um, what that was what uh, Bohr saw. These visible emissions. Um, if we look here, we'll see that um, anything ending in the n equals uh, one state that is a case where it's ultraviolet emission. So for example, even from the second down to the first shell, um, that is in the ultraviolet range with 122 nanometers as the wavelength. From the third down to the first is a bigger energy gap. And so there's gonna be a shorter wavelength. But notice that you could even go from say, the sixth down to the third, and that wouldn't be anywhere near as much energy. Look, it's a huge wavelength. That wouldn't be anywhere near uh, even the smallest of um, emissions that end in n equals two. And there's a good reasoning for this, that anything ending in n equals one gives us ultraviolet emission, anything ending in n equals two gives us visible, and anything ending in n equals three gives us IR. It's a very good reasoning behind that. And that is that as the energy level decreases, or sorry, increases, the spacing between the energy levels decreases. It's not like there's a ladder where every gap, every energy level is, is separated by the same amount. Um, as it happens, the biggest gap is from the first to the second shell. From the second to third, it's a smaller gap. Third to fourth, it's smaller still. And that actually explains um, why it is that you only have uh, ultraviolet emissions when you end in n equals one and only visible ending in n equals two and only IR ending in n equals three. It also can be explained if you kind of look at the gaps here just among the visible emissions. So if we're talking red, this is the smallest transition from the third down to the second. This is our red. In fact, I really should be writing this with a red um, marker here. All right, so we're going to say this is our 656. Um, the 486 is that blue green, which I'll I'll do. I'll call it like like this. So this is our four to two, and there's a fairly big gap between this red and this blue green. All right, because four to three is a moderate gap, but when I go to this blue violet. We'll go to maybe this one right here. All right, so that's from the fifth down to the second. And notice how this gap right here between, say, 434 and 486, that's much smaller than 486 to 656. And that's because this gap from six to five is smaller than this gap from four to three. Right? Um, 
And so that explains the spacing decrease. Um, it actually, the n equals infinity level, if you will, is barely higher than say like n equals seven. And in fact, if you were to take uh, light with a wavelength of 91 nanometers, remember 94 nanometers was what brought us up to the sixth shell. 93 or 92 would bring us to something higher. Well, only 91 is what it takes to get up to the infinity level, which is where the um, electron has gone from the first shell and it no longer is in any energy level, it has completely left the attractive pole of the nucleus. And so it's done what we call ionizing, it's ionized. Um, that is something that um, it's kind of analogous to if I were to jump super high, eventually I would leave Earth's orbit and be sort of in outer space. Um, similarly, if you use um, light with a wavelength of 91 nanometers and you shine that at um, hydrogen, the electron from hydrogen will just float away and be on its own in the n equals infinity level, not associated with the atom anymore. Um, as it happens also, any energy beyond that 91 nanometers can be absorbed by the photon. It just basically gives it more kinetic energy as the electron flies through space um, um, away from the nucleus. So, all right, um, that is pretty much all you can take, I think, from this FET simulation. It's been a long one, uh, but I hope this has been helpful. Very much encourage you to play with this simulation, which is linked um, in the description box. Uh, there's a lot of understanding that can come from this. So um, that's all for today. Uh, feel free to leave any questions or comments in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.